Good evening, everyone. Nosfaitha. Welcome to this current news session from our uh, biological science uh, department at Swansea University. This is on uh, chemical weaponry in the animal kingdom. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy this session and I will pass over to Kevin, who is leading tonight. Thank you very much. Hi, I'll, I'll just share my screen and then briefly introduce myself so you know who's going to be talking to you for the next little while. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can see that title screen. I'm sure Rhiannon will shout at me if you can't. Um, so I'm Kevin Arbuckle. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Biosciences um, at Swansea. So I mostly teach evolutionary biology, um, but my real passion is herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And I particularly like things that are quite dangerous, like this black mamba here um, that I had a good play with in a private collection in South Africa. So I tend to work um, a lot on venomous and poisonous animals and other um, species with chemical defences of various forms or chemical weaponry of various forms. So what I really wanted to do in this, um, this webinar is to give you an overview of just how diverse that whole world is. You might think of all these venomous animals as being very exotic and um, very hidden and very specialised. Reality, they're all around us all the time and they're just so incredibly diverse in all sorts of different levels. So I want to start off with giving you a whirlwind tour of those. So I want to start off particularly by giving you an introduction to the kinds of chemical weaponry that I'm talking about. Okay, So we tend to think about things like bees and wasps that tend to sting you or venomous snakes and things like that. And yes, they're all sort of venomous in that case, but we're a lot broader than that. So in terms of the diversity of the weaponry available, yeah, we do have venom. So we have this beautiful Cape Cobra here um, that has venomous fangs in its mouth. Um, and we also have things you wouldn't think about as well. So things like vampire bats in this case. Um, so if you're going to feed them blood, the problem with blood is that it clots very quickly. If you're trying to feed them something like that and it just clots up, you're not going to be able to feed very effectively at all. So most blood feeders, including these vampire bats here, um, will basically have a venom that contains lots of bits and bobs that break down um, your blood clotting systems in different ways. That keeps that blood flowing and means that the, um, the animal, in this case a vampire bat, can continue to feed for longer. So they do different things than the cobra does. Vampire bats are not going to kill you in any way, shape or form, um, certainly not from their venom, um, but they use that venom to facilitate their own feeding. So again, to make sure that they can get a meal, which is just what these cobras are doing as well. But there's other examples of venomous animals. The key thing of venom compared to what we'll come to next, which is poison, is that there is some way of injecting that into whoever you're trying to envenomate, so the victim. So yes, we have teeth, but we also have spines like this. Many other venomous fish tend to have spines as a way of... Well, uh, we tend to have stingers. So if we think of um, scorpions or bees and wasps, you have these really sharp needles that normally are attached to the back end, and that's when we usually call them stingers for no good reason at all. And again, those will run about and stab you and try to um, cause as much pain and havoc as possible on whatever benefits them most. Centipedes are another group of venomous animals, but in terms of the venom system, so how they get these things in, um, the toxins in, centipedes are a little bit weird. People tend to think of them baiting, partly because their venom um, pincers, if you like, are up this end, but they're not actually jaws. They're not jaws at all. What they are is front legs. So it's a bit like getting a venomous cuddle or a venomous pinch round about you. Um, although rather than being a nice cooch, um, what this venomous cuddle will do is inflict a world of pain on you. Um, they have lots of toxins that cause really quite severe pain, um, and they're also slightly psychotic and really active as well. Quite let's say, fun to work with. And an animal that you normally don't think about as venomous is these little hedgehogs here. Um, any hedgehogs, really, particularly European hedgehogs that you'll find run, running about um, in the woods round about Gower, round about Swansea, or pretty much wherever you are in the UK, um, although in smaller numbers than there used to be. Now, hedgehogs aren't venomous in the, in the classic sense. They don't have their own venom glands, so they don't produce their own venoms. But what they have been known to do is chew up um, either venomous animals like the venom glands of adders and other venomous snakes, or poison glands that you get in things like toads, common toads, those warts along the back and the back of the head. They'll chew those, 
And then they'll reach over and they'll lick their own spines. And basically, they'll coat their spines in the venom or poison of another species. And those spines become that injection mechanism that turns it into a venom. So they're not always, but they can be what's called facultatively, sometimes venomous. And in terms of weird delivery mechanisms of venom, you end up with things like slow lorises. Um, has anyone ever seen videos of slow lorises on YouTube? You can very quickly type yes or no, if, and Rhiannon can tell us if anyone's typed yes. So it became very popular um, basically to get videos of slow lorises doing this lovely little da 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 almost looks as if they're dancing and very cute with their hands above their heads. Yeah, we've got some yeses coming in. Oh, good. Um, the problem is that although these look nice and cute, what that is is a threat display. And why that's a threat display is that slow lorises actually have a two-part venom system. They have some secretions that they secrete out of their, um, out of their elbows, essentially, the insides of their elbows, and they have some secretions that come out of similar to their salivary glands in their mouth. And both of those parts are pretty harmless in themselves, but what they do, they put their arms up like that, make a nice threat display, and if you get a bit too close, they'll lick their elbow. Once they've done that, both of those secretions mix together and produce a really quite potent toxin that tends to basically dissolve flesh and dissolve skin and cause all sorts of horrible wounds. And then they will bite if you go even closer as well. So this kind of very cute dance is actually basically a threat display saying, go away or I will melt your face. Not quite as cute when you see it in that way. And it shows quite how threatened or how stressed out these, these animals are in these videos because they're basically acting threatened. So a wide range of kind of poison or venom systems in that case, but there's a lot of poisonous animals as well. This is actually a trick one because this is a, a keelback snake, an Asian keelback snake. This is actually both venomous and poisonous. By that I mean, it has venom glands in the mouth and fangs that can inject venom, just as we think about most venomous snakes. But these species also have poison glands. So they chomp away in poisonous toads and frogs and other things, and they take those toxins out of those toads and what's called sequester them. They hold them in their own glands in their neck. And this is why it's doing this fun little behavior where it's putting its head down and arching its neck towards you, because these venom glands here, or these poison glands here that it's storing, um, are now frontmost for the predator. If it tries to eat it, it's likely to get a mouthful of these quite potent toxins that it's sequestered. So with a poison, the snake doesn't bite you, you have to bite the snake. And that's when things get wrong, if you ingest this poison somehow. There's lots of animals that do this. So some quite well-known examples are things like pufferfish. Um, so they will secrete something called tetrodotoxin. Um, they'll either secrete it or they'll use bacteria within their skin and within their liver and things um, to make this toxin called tetrodotoxin. This is one of the most potent biological toxins we know. So if you're working with this, I never have, but if you're working with this and you want to move it from one building in the university to another building, you usually need armed security guards to basically escort you. It's essentially an incredibly potent toxin that cannot get into the nefarious hands. Um, it's covered by various terrorism legislation. These little cute things use it basically to avoid being eaten. And we're probably mostly aware of poison dart frogs in various forms. Um, they secrete a kind of alkaloid toxin. So alkaloids um, are very useful molecules. They um, include caffeine, um, so one of the most commonly consumed drugs in, in the world. Um, they include some, uh, they include nicotine. Again, very commonly consumed, if probably not very wise choice. Similarly, they um, are, include the toxins found in um, so hallucinogenic mushrooms produce alkaloid toxins, which have very weird effects. Um, aside from that, these things have um, what's called batrachotoxins, which means frog toxin. Um, it was initially discovered in frogs, and these are quite potent alkaloids, which cause really quite severe damage and are basically going to kill you if you get too much in your mouth at all. Um, interestingly, these birds, called pituis, um, are found in New Guinea, and they have pretty much exactly the same kind of toxin, very similar molecules to these batrachotoxins here. Interestingly, these animals don't um, create their own toxins, similar to what these snakes did before, where they sequester it from another animal. They will generally get these alkaloid toxins from things like ants, from mites, from beetles, and various other insects that do make these alkaloid toxins, um, and these will use them in their own defense. 
Um, I said this was called a Petui. That name actually has some kind of meaning. So um, this was the um, native New Guinean name um, that reflects the sound that you make if you try and eat it. You bite into a Petui and you go, Pt -t -t -t. they don't taste nice. They're basically saying, I don't taste nice. And if you even try and take one more bite out of me, you'll probably drop down dead. That probably explains these really bright warning colours as well. So um, blacks against quite bright colours like these orange or pinks or blues or greens um, tend to be really good warning signals. So you usually think of things like venoms and poisons if you're trying to think of chemical weapons in some way um, amongst animals. But there's lots of other variations in this as well. So this is a bombardier beetle. You do get these around the UK, but there's um, all sorts of bombardier beetles um, in all places in the world as well. And these have two different chemicals, one of which is peroxide, like um, some of your parents might use, or even you might use, um, to dye your hair blonde. Um, they mix that with another chemical just at the very tip of their abdomen here. And that mixture causes an intense heat to form, almost a boiling point. Um, and the pressure from that makes it explode out um, towards something that's attacking them, quite often ants. And it can basically twizzle this like the turret um, of a tank. So they can aim this really quite nicely. And if an ant comes and bites its back leg, it basically gets blasted in this mix of almost 100 degrees centigrade chemicals um, all over it. Other things that have these um, nauseous sprays, if you like, skunks are very well known for that. This little guy is doing a handstand, basically to say, oh, yeah, I'm here, I'm not going to run away, but if you come closer, you're going to stink for at least a fortnight and you're not going to get it off. Um, so they will have, it's not harmful, but it's extremely repugnant, um, and they will have these, what's called anal gland secretions, so a spray from a gland just around their bum um, that they'll use. And perhaps another quite well-known example of something that sprays out um, a chemical defence is in spitting cobras. So I've done a reasonable amount of work in spitting cobras, it's something I've got a kind of special interest in. Um, and they don't spit in the way that you would think about, but they basically put venom out through the fangs just in the same way as they would if they were biting. It's at much higher pressure in a way that sprays it forward. The fangs have got a lot of modifications as well to make sure they can aim that well. But yeah, basically they just spray it out, aim for the face and hopefully get it in your eyes, at which point if you don't wash it out quick enough, you end up blind. This is a nice long distance weapon. So for these things that spray at you, you don't even have to get close enough to take a bite out of them or for them to take a bite out of you. They can basically get you when you're maybe four or five foot away. Um, moving forward to things that don't spray and aren't poisonous in the same way, aren't venomous, but um, these millipedes, so these are very large millipedes that are quite commonly kept as pets. All sorts of millipedes, including the small ones that you'll get round about um, in the UK, um, do have various forms of chemical defence. Some of these even produce um, cyanide. Most of them have some form of benzoquinines, as they're called. So these large African, um, giant African millipedes that you'll get in the pet trade quite frequently produce this kind of almost reddish brown stuff um, from little glands along just above their legs. And that is okay, but if you get it on your hands, they basically dye your hands this kind of bright um, reddish orange color as well. If you leave it on there for too long and without washing your hands, it can cause some sort of damage. So it can start to break down those skin cells at the top. They don't cause that much damage in that sense, but they will dye your hands basically until you shed your skin again. Um, I decided to see if this actually has an effect and tried licking this. This is not a picture of my tongue, but this is exactly what happened within about 20 to 25 seconds of me touching some of this secretion to the tip of my tongue. So you can see if you're a predator trying to eat it and you're a lot smaller than something the size of a human, um, you would basically get a really intense um, reaction and have quite a lot of pain really quickly after putting something like that in your mouth. And that was only a little tiny bit I put to my tongue, not basically half a millipede um, worth of this secretion. So it works very well. It's harmful, but only, um, but not lethal, and only in a kind of relatively mild way compared to some of the other examples we've seen before. But it doesn't even have to be that harmful. So in terms of chemical weaponry, few things basically use glue instead of anything toxic. So these are spitting spiders. Um, you'll see these occasionally walking about the walls, usually somewhere at night, um, you walking about interior walls of houses. They don't do well outside. Um, they basically live inside people's houses um, pretty much throughout the temperate world. There's some species live outside in the tropics, but that's about it. And you can see that they've got this really high dome on top of their head. 
About half of this is occupied by a venom gland, so it produces those harmful toxins it uses to catch the prey. The other half um, is covered, is basically contains a massive glue gland, which produces a really sticky substance. And as the name spitting spider suggests, similar to spitting cobras, they can spray that, um, that glue and actually it mixes with the venom, so you've got a kind of venomous glue um, that spits out, and they'll wiggle their head back and forth so that it creates a zigzag. That allows them to basically pin down a fly that might be two or three times bigger than them without getting anywhere near it. They can then walk over and leisurely bite its leg, kill it, and then eat it from there. These little creatures are very strange. Most of you probably haven't come across them at all. Um, certainly not in the UK, but you may not even have heard of them. These are things called velvet worms or onychophorans. Velvet worms are named because they look and sort of feel a tiny little bit like velvet, maybe it's like wet velvet. Um, they basically look a little bit like a slug with lots of legs, um, albeit not quite so slimy, and they have a really weird chemical um, offence, so they will use this to catch prey. They'll feed on things like earthworms and other smaller insects and bits and bobs like that, and they look really cute when they've got these two little um, tentacles that they'll kind of wiggle about, similar to the spitting spider's fangs, and basically stick out this really kind of gluey substance to glue, even though something as slimy as a worm and can just mooch over to it and chomp that away. Um, have any of you grown cabbages in your garden? And if you have, have any of you seen these caterpillars at all? So these are one of two species of cabbage white um, caterpillars. You'll see cabbage white butterflies fluttering about. Um, and on your cabbages, which is predominantly what they eat, you'll see their little green things that live in their own or these black and white, uh, black and yellow striped caterpillars, um, they usually live in kind of groups. You'll usually have maybe up to 10, 15 of them in a plant, maybe as few as four or five. And they will hang about together. And it turns out if you go and you prod them, either with the back of a paintbrush, back of a pen or your finger, and you prod them just about in the middle, they've got really tough skin, so they don't come out harmed from that at all, but they will rear up and they will vomit on you. And their vomit looks like this this kind of green, uh, green stuff um, that comes out of their gut. I say vomit because most of it is vomit. They will occasionally put some other chemicals in there that may or may not have some kind of toxic function. It's not going to do you any harm. But most of this is basically concentrated cabbage. Now, if you imagine a cabbage, and then imagine a cabbage just shrunk down into a smaller and smaller little bit, you end up with Brussels sprouts. Turns out in... Uh, Let's say a past life when I was working in these, I thought, oh, how, how bad can it actually taste? So I stuck my finger into some of this caterpillar vomit, touched that to my tongue, and turns out it does taste exactly like Brussels sprouts, um, which is great if you like Brussels sprouts. I don't, so it would work as a distasteful defense to me. If vomit isn't bad enough for you, these lizards can spray out something else. They basically um, cause themselves to bleed from their eyes and they can shoot that blood up to about um, a metre to a metre and a half away from these quite small lizards um, and directed usually towards canid predators. So things like domestic dogs, jackals, things like that. Now, these things are a bit strange. How they do this is they have, as with everything, as with everyone, you've got... Um, arteries that take blood into your head, veins that take blood out of your head. And what they do is they simply shut off the veins that are taking blood out of the head. That means that as the blood's keep pumping into the head, it starts to get more and more high pressure and they have very, very sensitive capillaries, so blood vessels just at the back of the eye, which are really sensitive to bursting and rupturing. So basically they cause themselves to hemorrhage blood just by causing high blood pressure with weak blood vessels and they're able to direct that to some degree and shoot it out into the face of usually dog-like predators. Um, and it works really well. It's probably quite distasteful. Um, certainly dogs tend to try and wipe the stuff off them. Um, if they get any in their mouth, they look absolutely horrified. Um, but also it's quite unpleasant just to get blasted in the face with blood from a few feet as well. Some insects do a maybe sort of less impressive version of bleeding. So this is called reflex bleeding, where um, in this case, this ladybird has basically managed to cause blood to leak out from the joints of its legs. Um, you can see that this doesn't look like what you might think of as blood. So insects tend to have all sorts of different um, colours of blood, often quite clear, sometimes a little bit orangey, um, sometimes a bit bluish. In this case, it's almost oak, oak, 
oak, egg yolk yellow, um, and this contains all sorts of kind of harmful chemicals as well. So it's not just the kind of bleeding onto things with a distasteful component like the horned lizards were doing, um, but um, it's also can be quite toxic if a predator decides to go ahead and try and eat these things. And that's one of the reasons that ladybirds are this beautiful kind of black and red or orange or yellow colours. Again, it's a warning signal to say, go away or I will bleed in your mouth. So that's a kind of very quick overview of the kinds of um, chemical weaponry that all these animals can use. And of course, we've come across some of those animals um, in passing. Really what I want to do is introduce you to the diversity of animal groups that actually use these as well. So to, for that, I'm going to use trees. Um, not this kind of tree, although this is actually a stinging tree. So think of it as a stinging nettle, but tree size and enough to, in some cases, put you in hospital wanting morphine for pain. He's Australian, of course, because anything that starts off with that description is usually Australian. But that's not what I mean. What I'm talking about when I talk about trees is phylogenies. What do I mean by phylogenies? Well, you'll probably be familiar with the idea of family trees. Some of you might even have reconstructed your family tree to some degree. And these are basically diagrams which have branching patterns which show up um, to give you an idea of the relatedness between different organisms. In this case, it's different family members. So if you trace this up, you can see that um, those that are more closely related are joined by fewer branches and they have fewer of these what's called nodes, so these points where these branches join. So you can tell that these three little offspring are more closely related to their parents because they only join up here than they are to their grandparents where they have to go all the way up here to join. And you get an idea of the relatedness between groups of animals. I tend to use evolutionary trees, which is exactly the same idea, but for species instead of individuals, and to address all sorts of questions about evolution. So in this case, you have um, a phylogeny of a pretty fish, a pretty amphibian, a pretty mammal, a pretty bird, and a pretty reptile. And you can see how that works. So using this diagram, you can get a feel for the fact that birds and reptiles are more closely related um, than reptiles are, for instance, to amphibians, where you have to go way back here. So this information and relatedness can be quite useful and can help you to kind of categorize the diversity of life into some kind of meaningful and manageable framework. So this is a phylogenetic tree, not just of vertebrates, as that last one was, but of animals as a whole. So we've all the way down to kind of sponges and jellyfish here, um, through insects, um, through to snakes, through to mammals, through to mollusks, sea urchins, all sorts of different species. And wherever you see a kind of blue or a red or a green line here, that's a group where venom has evolved. So let's even ignore most of those chemical defences and just focus on venom to give you an idea of the diversity of animal life that uses this kind of approach to deterring predators or catching their prey or whatever. And you can see that in the vast majority of animal groups, certainly all the major animal groups, you have at least one origin of venom that's happened. So venom is really widespread across the animal kingdom. Let's again have a quick um, overview of the diversity of animal life that has these. I can't obviously get through all of these, so I'm just going to get through um, a few examples. So thinking of Nadarians, I'm sure many of you will at least have been warned away from being stung by jellyfish if you've ever been to the beach. Um, but other things such as corals and anemones as well um, have these what's called nidocytes. So they have these single cells that contain venom and they contain little harpoons that will shoot out and inject that venom into you if you rub it. Or if you're a fish or a crab, as I've seen some sea, urchin, um, some sea anemones eating, um, they'll basically kill the prey and then suck that in as well. Arachnids, so this is things that you'll be um, used to thinking about as venomous, so people tend to get freaked out about spiders, even though this one is gorgeous and looks like a Christmas tree, um, or scorpions with these really obvious stingers. Um, yes, they, they're venomous as well. But then you get to really weird things. So this is a remipede crustacean. Crustaceans are normally things like crabs and lobsters and shrimp and prawns and all these things that you um, you probably These remipedes are real weird crustaceans. Despite being a real broad group, crustaceans weren't thought to be venomous at all until just a few years ago. And then someone found that in these little things that hide away in the dark in the middle of underground sea caves, um, that they have um, venom glands just behind their jaws as well. So again, these have an oral venom system, so they use their jaws to inject venom into the prey in this case, although apparently it's also quite stingy if it gets you in the finger as well. They're quite small, and they're a real weird group of crustaceans that break the rule that crustaceans are not venomous. 
Centipedes I mentioned before, so with that kind of venomous pinch that they use, the two arms that will basically just stab into you, um, that are filled with venom. But lots of insects are venomous as well, so just as a few examples of that, um, this is a kind of bug. You know it's a bug instead of any other kind of insect, because bugs always have um, these long, spiky uh, feeding tubes. Sometimes, if they're plant bugs, they just use that to stick into a plant stem and they'll suck up all the plant juices. If they're predatory bugs, they'll use that to stab into prey, usually other insects. And for most of the predatory ones, they basically use a venom to paralyze their insect prey, basically take it down very quickly and eat that without the risk of retaliation and getting injured themselves. These are a group of venomous insects that everyone's probably most familiar with. So um, I suspect that the vast majority of you at some point have been stung by either a bee or a wasp. And um, if you're really unlucky, you might have even been stung by a stinging ant. Um, and of course, we're used to this kind of idea. So really conspicuous yellow and black insects that fly about and if they get, if they get annoyed, they'll sting you with a venom that causes intense and immediate pain. And again, acts as a defense to say, go away or my mates will come around and sting you as well. Similar to the vampire bat from earlier on, one thing you might not think about as venomous is um, mosquitoes or the blood feeding insects. So again, anything that feeds in blood needs to stop it clotting. And it basically they'll use some form of venom um, full of anticoagulants that stop your blood clotting to basically keep that coming into its mouth. And things like mosquitoes and many other insects as well that um, feed in blood, they won't just use anticoagulants to keep the blood flowing, but they'll also inject a whole bunch of painkillers. Because the last thing you want if you're a mosquito is for whatever you've bitten to know you're there and you get squished. So you want to make it as painless as possible while you sap up the blood. This is my finger, by the way. Um, my uh, wife, when I first showed her this photo, immediately recognised it because apparently my fingers are short and stubby. Quite sure if that's a compliment or not, but never mind. Um, anyway, uh, but yes, this is basically, I was trying to take a photo of a, a tortoise um, and looked up um, as I was taking a photo and noticed that this little mosquito was sitting basically full of my blood um, as I was taking it. So I managed to get a camera and get a nice little photo of that. It's a nice demonstration of quite how full we can get as well. But I didn't really notice that until I looked back. So it, it emphasizes that kind of painkiller aspect. Um, as well as the keeping the blood flowing. There's all sorts of caterpillars that have all sorts of venom as well. So again, similar to uh, many of those insects and similar to most fish, caterpillars use venom not to catch prey because they're almost entirely feeding on leaves. And what they use it for is to tell big mammals or birds that come along and want to eat them, you really don't want to eat me or you will hurt. So, a very good rule of thumb, it doesn't apply in every case, but in enough cases that you definitely want to use it. If you don't know what a caterpillar is and it's very hairy, don't touch it. At a minimum, these hairs will usually just break off, so it's almost like very thin glass spicules that basically if, they, if you touch them at all, they will start to disintegrate and disintegrate into your skin and cause intense irritation. In many cases, those um, same little hairs will be filled with venom. So as it breaks up, all the venom also goes into those little wounds that it, they've caused as well. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, don't touch hairy caterpillars. This looks like something from a horror film. This is a marine worm, so a marine polychaete worm. We used to think of worms as earthworms that will crawl about your soil, but earthworms are actually only a relatively small number of the total worms. And polychaetes are basically the ones you'll find at the beach. They're the lugworms that make those little casts that you have to dig up. Um, if you've ever been down um, at low tide at any rocky shore and you've seen the mussel beds, you might have seen a lot of green worms going around it as well. All of those are polychaetes. There's thousands and thousands of species of them. Some of them, yeah, look like some kind of monstrosity. And these big jaws are accompanied by venom glands within the head as well. It helps it catch on to, in this case, fish. Um, so you basically get a worm that's buried in the soil that still manages to catch really fast and active prey like fish just by grabbing hold of them, injecting venom and paralyzing them um, within a couple of seconds. You think of snails as very innocuous type things, but mollusks such as snails and this octopus here aren't always quite as innocuous as you think. Yes, your garden snails you get in your garden are perfectly harmless. Um, this is a cone snail. Cone snails are incredibly, uh, incredibly diverse in the toxins that they have. 
They have um, little harpoons in here that they'll basically slowly move towards a fish, for instance. So a lot of these snails will be able to catch fish as well. They'll move towards and then all of a sudden they'll shoot out a harpoon that's full of venom. And again, some of the most potent venoms known um, are inside these clone snails. You can see videos where basically they brought it down in less than a second. The fish is just on the ground, unable to move. It's a really potent um, paralytic um, toxin. But they also use a form of insulin. So most invertebrates don't really have insulin. It's quite specific to vertebrates um, in any kind of regulatory way. So if anyone's diabetic, they'll know quite how important insulin is. If your insulin levels are all over the place, you end up going into um, essentially a diabetic shock. Um, these will exploit this as well. So basically, they don't even have to get close enough to harpoon a fish to kill it. They can basically just crawl up somewhere in the vicinity and they'll release a kind of weaponized form of insulin that's changed to make it that bit more potent than the one that's just flowing about your body anyway. And as soon as the fish detect this, it basically puts them into shock and they'll drop down dead without apparently anything even happening because you can't see all this insulin just floating about in the water. These blue-ringed octopuses are possibly one of the better-known venomous octopuses. Um, they do have a venomous bite as well, but they also have tetrodotoxin, that really potent thing that was in those puffer fish um, earlier on. They also have that throughout their skin. So again, these are actually both venomous and poisonous um, organisms. They have poison in the skin, so if something eats them, it's in trouble. And they've got venom um, in their jaws as well. So whatever it's trying to eat, they paralyze and um, eat much safer as well. And the last of the invertebrates, I know there's a lot of invertebrates in this slide, but that's because there's a lot of invertebrates. Um, so if you think of echinoderms, these really slow moving things like starfish and brittle stars and sea urchins, most of these will um, basically just graze on whatever's around, so they don't really need it to catch prey so much, but they will have a lot of defensive um, components as well. So in these um, sea urchins, you often see these particular kinds, long spine sea urchins in aquariums and display aquariums because they're quite common um, in those kind of displays. Um, but aside from these real long spines, they have um, a venom that they use partly to catch little tiny prey. So you have some little um, venomous pincers down here um, along the body. And they will also use venom in these um, spines as well. And that, that basically just creates a huge amount of pain. You'll find that with most defensive toxins that are used to basically repel a predator, it causes very fast and very intense pain. It does that job very well. Most starfish are not venomous, but the crown of thorns starfish is one exception to this. And you can get the idea that it's probably not going to be good to touch because it's thorns or all these spikes. These are the starfish that are causing major problems that have been introduced or massively increased in abundance around coral reefs. They tend to basically eat a lot of the other inhabitants of coral reefs, including the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and they're a major conservation problem. Um, and it doesn't help that most of the predators that would normally feed and regulate the populations of things like starfish um, are deterred by these venomous. So if we move on to vertebrates, let's keep in the marine realm for just a second. You end up with things like lots and lots of venomous fish. This is a stonefish. Venomous sharks, the support Jackson shark that's got a venomous spur on its fins, and stingrays, which are fairly well known for being venomous um, nowadays as well. We tend to think of these things as very tropical problems. So these are all from tropical regions. In fact, at least these two are from around Australia. But um, even in the UK, you occasionally find people standing on sand and realize getting an incredibly painful sensation, and they realize that there's a weaver fish. Um, what's sitting just under the sand um, at low tide. And the weaver fish basically bury themselves in the sand and let just one little thin needle-like spine stick up at the top. And if anything goes to stand on it, they impale themselves in that spine. And like most defensive venoms, they experience a world of pain very quickly. Amphibians are really good for poisons. So if you think of poison dart frogs, there's a whole host of other examples, even of common toads that you get in the UK contain poisons. But there aren't that many that are actually venomous. So again, by venomous, what I mean is they have some way of um, injecting that venom into the victim in some way. This is one exception to that. So you might notice these row of quite bright orange spots down the back. These are poison glands, so they produce poison. If something just eats that, it will also be poisoned. Um, you'll notice that there's poison glands all over the place, but these ones are particularly bright. What the sharp ribbed, ribbed newt does, as it basically pulls its, if it's really threatened, pulls its ribs up 
and stabs its own ribs through the side of its body, making sure that as the ribs stab through its own body, um, they go through these, uh, these poison glands as well. They get coated in poison and all of a sudden it becomes venomous because you've got very sharp ribs that are coated in poison that basically attach onto whatever um, part of a predator is trying to grab it. I'm not going to spend any time talking about these because everyone knows that there are venomous snakes. There are venomous lizards as well. Um, these are very clearly venomous lizards like this Gila monster. Um, so Gila monsters very rarely cause any deaths. Um, but again, the, they use their venom unlike snakes. Um, these Gila monsters use their venom predominantly for defense and it causes a lot of pain. Um, these fellas are present in Mexico and um, the southern states, southwest states of the United States. Um, and in true American fashion, what sometimes happens, there's at least two or three cases on record of someone being in so much pain after getting bitten by um, a Gila monster that, you know, it's America, everyone's got a gun in their pocket and they've essentially shot themselves just to get away from the pain. So it's not going to kill you, but it might make you wish um, the pain would end regardless of what that takes. Mammals are something that people don't think are venomous at all. People tend to think that mammals are these little soft, cuddly, fluffy things. And in fairness, most of them are. Maybe not cuddly, but they're soft and fluffy. But there are exceptions to that as well. I've already mentioned the vampire bat. Platypuses are well known, so they have uh, the male platypus has a spur on its hind leg. And these are quite unusual in that um, rather than for catching prey or um, defending themselves, they will basically kick each other. Um, during the breeding season. So when you have lots of male platypuses competing for a female platypus to make little baby platypuses, um, the males will basically kick each other with these venomous spurs and it will cause all sorts of injuries and problems for them. These are selenodons, so these are actually quite large. Um, they almost look like shrews, but they're a separate group of animals. And they live on the Caribbean islands. Um, they get to maybe up to a foot and a half long, so they're not small at all, it's like bigger than a big rat. Um, and they again have um, venom glands in their mouth. So they have sharp teeth, as most of these rodenty looking things do. Um, and yeah, they can bite that way. Does anyone know what this one is? This last one? Let's give it a few seconds in case anyone can answer. It's a test of UK mammals. True. Yes. Well done. So this is a water shrew in particular. These, these are found quite often. In fact, I was driving back home from work the other day and right in front of the road, a little water shrew just went from one side to the other. Um, they're really distinctive because they have this um, kind of quite black and quite white underside. They're usually found around kind of watery type, wetland type areas. But they also have a venom in their mouth. So they'll basically bite um, worms, other insects, and various other animals that they'll eat. So they'll eat frogs and things as well. And they'll inject that venom and it will again just paralyze it. And then they can store that away and they can eat it at the leisure without it kind of rotting. So it's just still alive, but it's just sitting there and not able to move away. I have actually managed to be bit by a water shrew when I was small mammal trapping one day. And for something the size of a human, it just causes a little kind of tingly sensation. You know, it's not just a bite, but it's also not really much to write home about either. So why are so many animals venomous? Again, I'll just focus on venom because we could go into a whole other world if we're focusing all those different defenses from earlier on. Well, as I said, a lot of these animals, such as snakes, use them predominantly to catch prey. They're predators, they use it for predatory purposes. Others, such as this skunk here, or the Gila monsters I was mentioning before, will use their defences as defences. So they'll use their chemical weaponry as defences, um, whether that's venom or otherwise. But there are a few other more rare examples. I mentioned the platypus that uses it to fight with other male platypuses. Slow lorises will basically do the same thing. They will use their venom, okay, they will use it in defences, I mentioned earlier, but they'll predominantly use it to fight other lorises, and that basically causes so much tissue destruction. This is a year after another loris had bitten this one, and if, you can see it started to grow back quite a bit, but there's still quite extensive tissue damage all around the face and around the eye from this. So they'll use it in competition with each other. And in a few cases, they can even use it in courtship. They can use it when they're trying to attract a female to mate with them. Scorpions always do this little dance. They'll basically hold pincers and they'll waltz round about in circles and it'll be very nice and romantic. 
Certain scorpions, such as these flat rock scorpions, the males have a much longer tail, and while they're doing this little dance, he'll swing his tail around the side and inject the female um, in her abdomen. And that acts as a sedative, so it calms the female down, and it also acts as an aphrodisiac. So basically, it makes the female more likely to accept him as the future daddy of her babies. I see what use is it. Really, I should say what uses I have they. Um, so I've mentioned these four different kinds of function as if they're kind of independent, but we sort of know they're not. I mean, snake venoms um, have evolved almost entirely to catch prey, but that doesn't stop them being involved in quite horrific snake bite injuries. So venomous snake bite um, is hugely, there must be at least about a million bites a year, um, often more in different, if you can, different countries. A quarter of a million people die and a lot of other people are maimed every year um, from snake bite. That's obviously the snake using it as a defense mechanism, not as predation, even though it's been used for that. So I just want to finish after that kind of whirlwind tour with a little bit of a discussion. I spoke about the diversity of animals, the diversity of the weaponry itself. And I want to talk a bit about how that, um, in this case, poisons and venoms, I'm going to focus on for the last little bit of this talk, can influence the diversity of animal life as well. So it's not just that venoms and poisons and things are diverse and the animals that have them are diverse, but venom can potentially actually lead to more and more species being generated even more quickly. So we know that diverging ecology can lead to diverging species. If they have different habitats, so they live in different places, or they specialize in different diets, or they come out in the night versus during the day, they're not going to breed with each other and you end up with speciation happening. So the formation of a new species branching off. We know that what's called arm races are thought to favor speciation. Okay, so arms races are basically when you have two enemies that are battling against each other in an evolutionary sense. So it could be predator and prey. The predator evolves adaptations to help it catch prey. The prey doesn't want to be caught, so it evolves onto predator defenses to help it escape the predator. The, pre the predator then evolves things to get round that anti predator defense and vice versa, and it just keeps going and going and going. And you've got this really constant evolutionary race going on, and that seems to favor um, the divergence into multiple different species. So, you start to ask whether chemical defenses in that case, because that's part of an arms race, can increase the diversification of species as well. So by diversification, I mostly mean going from one ancestor to lots of descendant species over evolutionary time. So this is the tree I showed you earlier, and I'm mostly focused on the relationships, so the branching patterns here, if you like. Actually, phylogenetic trees are um, symbols of time as well. So this is very old, this is now, and this is somewhere in between. So you can trace evolutionary history by essentially walking along and walking down the branches of this tree. And you're essentially walking forward in time or walking backwards in time if you go that way. And because of this, you can get an idea of what's called diversification rates. So speciation rates. This is a speciation event because you've got a species branching off. This is a speciation event. This is a speciation event. That's a speciation event. But how many of them are there over that time span? So we've got one, two, three, four. And if this was over 10 million years, you would have four um, speciation events in 10 million years, 0.4, so divided by 10 speciation events in each million years. Okay. So we talk about diversification rates and speciation rates, it's basically meaning um, how many of these events happen per million years including time in that. How do we model this? Well, let's imagine dragons. Um, so let's imagine this dragon here, and let's say it evolves an entirely new trait. Let's say it involves wings, okay? What those wings do? Well, those wings might allow it to fly to different parts of the world. Some might end up at the North Pole and be really cold and turn black so that they can get more heat. Some of them might stay the same color. And this divergence, this, these wings directly lead to more speciation happening. Alternatively, these dragons could be flying about to more areas, encounter more angry kings um, who send out their knights and kill more of these and basically increase the extinction rate. Okay, so you could have the same trait, in this case wings, um, leading to more speciation or more extinction. And this is what we mean by diversification generally, how speciation and extinction trade off and lead. So we can model this, which is a fancy way of saying we think we know what's going on and let's just see if we can um, put some data to this and see how well our models match the data. To model this, well, we have three things going on, really. We have the evolution of the trait, in this case, wings. We've got the evolution of wings. They could either evolve wings or they could lose wings. 
You might have a speciation rate, so how much speciation happens when they don't have wings, and how much speciation happens when they do have wings. And then you could have the same for, uh, for extinction as well. So extinction rates for wingless and winged things, speciation rates um, for wingless and winged things. Now, as interesting as dragons are, they're not very tractable to study, they're quite difficult to get hold of, um, and wings aren't anywhere near as exciting as poisons and venoms. I decided to study this, um, the effects of venoms and poisons um, using um, poisonous amphibians instead, and basically fit that exact same model. So in this case, you can have um, poisons evolving into this poison dart frog, or being lost like this green tree frog, and you have speciation rates and extinction rates for poisonous and non-poisonous frogs. We could make it so that the speciation rates don't differ between these two. So the speciation rate of non-toxic frogs is the same as that of toxic frogs, same with extinction. Um, and you could basically evolve or lose toxins just as easily. It may be easier to gain or to lose toxins, but it still doesn't have an effect on speciation or extinction. So this is this model. So that's equal to that, that's equal to that, but these can differ. We could say that it, um, evolving poisons allow these frogs um, to differ rate, but they have the same speciation rate, or vice versa, so they can have different speciation rates, but the same extinction rates. You don't have to worry about the details of this, but fitting all those models to um, a phylogeny of these frogs, which contains that time information as well on the record of those speciation events, um, basically gives you the idea that this model, where all of these are different and nothing's equal to anything else, is about 99% likely to be the best model out of all of those when you fit that to data on actual frogs. Look at what this means. So this is the rate. So lots more um, transitions happening. So lots more gains or losses of poisons happening. Not many happening. And you can see that the gains of toxins happen much easier than the losses. So it's easier to become toxic than it is to become non-toxic. That makes sense because if you're the only toxic animal in a the population, they're probably going to eat your friends. If you're the only non-toxic animal in that population, they're probably going to eat you. This seems to happen in all sorts of different scenarios as well. So this is neotropical butterflies from South America. And this is to, um, a measure of their toxicity going from black, very low toxicity to through blue, orange, and eventually red, high toxicity. And if you follow this down in this tree, you'll never get a situation where it goes to lower and lower toxicity. It always goes higher and higher and higher. So again, it's much easier to evolve to be more toxic than it is to become less toxic. So let's go back to the frogs. With speciation rates, we find that um, toxic amphibians, so toxic frogs, tend to have a speciation rate much higher, maybe about two and a half times higher um, than non-toxic frogs. So yes, poison does um, cause speciation. It also causes more extinction, so you tend to get more extinction happening in toxic frogs than non-toxic frogs. And if you combine those together, it actually means that extinction increases more what that means is that toxic frogs, you actually tend to get less of them over time. You're getting more forming with speciation, but you're getting more going extinct as well. So you end up with this strange situation where um, frogs or amphibians generally, once they become toxic, it's very difficult to become non-toxic again. But once they are toxic, also they're more likely to go extinct and they're not likely to diversify as fast. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. If you look at their current conservation status, so whether they're threatened, right now, never mind over evolutionary time, you find the same idea. You find that toxic frogs are 60% more likely to be threatened than non-toxic frogs. And if you look at, um, look at other groups of animals as well, so other tetrapods, so that's mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, um, using this kind of analysis, which I won't bother going into, you don't need to know the details, it turns out that venom increases diversification, but poison also increases diversification as well, so these speciation rates except when you add amphibians. So amphibians are doing something weird where amphibians don't tend to diversify as much when they're toxic, but other tetrapods do, so other um, mammals, birds, and reptiles do. If you look at fishes and insects, you basically find the same pattern. So venomous fishes and venomous insects diversify about twice as fast as non-venomous ones do. So it seems to be this kind of really general pattern. So you can see that not only have, is there a huge diversity of animals and a huge diversity of um, types of uh, poisonous, venomous, and all sorts of other chemical weaponry that animals possess, but 
but that weaponry in itself leads to more and more animals accumulating faster and faster and leads to some of that diversity of life that you see around you every time you walk out your house. That tends to lead to these beautiful images like this, where you have really brightly coloured warning signals, but actually look quite pretty for us. In this case, it's not actually a warning signal, but it's still a venomous animal and it still looks very, very pretty. And if you find videos of them, you can see them going wild as well. So, I've left a minimum of five minutes for questions. I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer as well. So if anyone's got anything um, or wants to ask about the talk or the course or anything else I can be useful for or interesting for, fire away. Thank you. Oh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, let me just open up my camera again. While you are thinking of your questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat function. We can keep an eye on both. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. So thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, virtually and we will uh, do the questions uh, just after I've stopped recording. Thank you to those for joining us on the video.